Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this thought-provoking uh, debate program, the Pan-African Debate, brought to you by your number one television, uh, Africa Media. Uh, today, we again uh, want to discuss another very important uh, topic, and we are looking at Africa's representation in global decision making and the implication of these uh, to the African uh, continent, uh, Africa's representation in global decision making, uh, looking at what this mean for the African continent, you know, with the uh, global transformation taking place, Africa continues to gain momentum and influence, especially at the global stage. This is visible in the recent admission of the African Union as a permanent member of the group of 20, uh, one of the world's biggest economic blocs. That is, however, uh, crucial. It is, however, crucial to analyze the implications of Africa having a substantial voice in shaping global policies. Now, joining us today are esteemed experts who will engage in a discursive debate, providing us with uh, valuable uh, insight or analysis. And I'm glad to be your host, Clarice Widaren. And together, Lester and back on this very important discussion. This is the Pan African Debate. <laughs> Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Thank you once more and welcome to the Pan-African debate, ladies and gentlemen. Today we want to analyze uh, Africa and of course Africa's representation in global decision making and what uh, this will mean for the continent Africa. Uh, this uh, topic is coming as the African Union was recently admitted as a permanent member of the group of 20, uh, one of the uh, uh, largest economic blocs across the global world and of course want to look at the implications of this and how this can change the narratives about the African continent or can this bring a new perspective in Africa's uh, uh, foreign policies and what are uh, the advantages or challenges of Africa, uh, the African Union uh, being uh, admitted as a, a permanent uh, member in the bloc. It should be noted uh, that before this uh, recent uh, admission of the 55 uh, member uh, state of the African Union, uh, South Africa was the lone African country uh, that was part of the group of 20. So what are your implications as today? Or what are your, your thoughts or insight as we today analyze this very important moment like we underlined already in the preamble? This is a world of uh, global transformation. And of course, what brings this global transformation? And where is the place of Africa and other African countries being in the political sphere, economic sphere, and uh, what have you. So together for two hours, we are going to engage in this informative as well as interactive debate program to bring more insight on our topic for discussion. And I want to thank you all for being with us. Time for us to unveil this uh, X team uh, panel of experts. And I will be taking you straight away to India. Let's uh, meet uh, Purnima Anand, who is uh, president for BRICS International Forum. Hello to you, madam, and thanks for honoring this invitation today. Thank you very much, Clarice. It is always a pleasure to come on your channel and to talk about your very interesting international topics. And today is really wonderful topic because I must congratulate Africa continent, Africa family, Africa community uh, to be a member of G20. It will increase the landscape. No doubt Africa is the second largest continent in the world on this planet. And they are having full rights uh, to uh, showcase their diversity because in Africa, so many cultures, so many languages, and uh, many uh, religions are existing. And it is very rich region uh, with the natural resources and uh, very warm uh, climate. 
so africa is very huge very big and uh, wonderful people and now uh, after brick summit uh, because uh, as you know 15th brick summit happened in uh, africa johannesburg south africa and this took very really very big shape and big uh, attraction of the world in new turbulence uh, period uh, which is developed after the ukraine crisis so uh, many countries are looking forward for their space in new economic model and i feel africa lead in this model because uh, african countries are having natural resources uh, the in the current world order which we developed during last 75 years after second world war we saw that in europe in america we use the highest uh, natural resources of africa and asia now it is all at saturation point we need to understand the climate change situation and green missions which is uh, copenhagen summit agenda so uh, i feel that africa will play very important role uh, in upcoming uh, uh, economic uh, new situations and uh, because uh, in africa the most uh, uh, common language is arabic and uh, ua is also part of the brics and uh, i think this will make more uh, stronger bridge between africa ua and asia and uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, we'll be coming to you subsequently uh, uh, dear Punima Ananda, uh, for better uh, understanding or analysis on our topic for discussion this day. Let's stay with, uh, in India, we are meeting uh, uh, Dawi Jang. She is the founder, Karma, uh, uh, the, the founder of uh, the uh, Kama Foundation. Hello to you and thanks for joining us once more in the Pan African debate. Namaskar. Hello to each one of you. And thanks for having me with you today. And we're all I happy to would know that really you're like to us. congratulate. Okay. Gladys, I would like to congratulate the entire African Union for being incorporated in G20. And I think that has been one of the highlights of India's G20 presidency. Uh, from the very beginning of our presidency, our Honorable Prime Minister wanted to had this mission. This was one of the most closest to heart mission that our our government, our country had when we start, presided over G20, that we wanted the voice of the Africans to be incorporated in G20. And that feat on the very first day of the leader summit. So congratulations to Africa and uh, going forward also in the future, as a proud Indian, I assure that we will always stand by our fellow human beings in the other part of the world. Absolutely. It's about uh, humanity. It's about uh, working uh, together for the uh, uh, greater uh, prosperity of every nation. Uh, let's uh, now take you to the United States. Uh, we are meeting uh, at uh, Arthur Mobley as a journalist and historian. We are glad to have you on today's edition of the Pan-African Debate, sir. Thank you very much, Clarice. I'm always excited about joining you and uh, always happy to be here. And it's always a pleasure to know that uh, you are always available to share your insight about the happenings, not just in uh, the international arena, but also happenings of that affect the African continent. We actually appreciate your time and all your insights, sir. Thank you again. Okay, we are also joined by Mr. Elijah Enwako, who is a researcher with Leeds University on African Development. It's always a pleasure having you on the Pan-African Debate, sir. <clears throat> Thanks for having me one more time, Clarice. Uh, hopefully we're gonna have a very fruitful discussion about um, the recent inclusion of the African Union into the G20, which uh, it's a welcome idea in many sphere, 
uh, even though it's debatable and a lot of discussion going on within the uh, African diaspora as to what does it mean for Africa, what is Africa stands to benefit. Africa is part of different other organizations and member states of Africa uh, into different other organizations and what has that brought up to Africa. So hopefully we can highlight if there is any at all, what this means for the whole of Africa as a whole. So thanks for having me one more time. We should be thanking you all for always making our time to share this uh, insight regarding uh, the uh, uh, development across the global world and particularly across uh, the African uh, continent. Uh, just to remind uh, our viewers tuning in uh, that this is the Pan African uh, Debate and it is a program of which is informative and interactive. Program of which is inter ac uh, actually, uh, during the course of the program, we're going to give you a uh, televiewer the opportunity to participate to share your opinions uh, by dialing the numbers which you will have on your screen but before that time let's dive straight away uh, to the uh, uh, analytics of uh, this uh, topic which is uh, uh, Africa's representation in decision or global decision making and what this uh, mean uh, for the uh, continent uh, Africa we kick off with you uh, Mr. Elijah and uh, our topic of course is emanating from the recent development uh, which we know the G20 summit where we saw the admission of the African Union as a permanent member of the bloc. Can we have your uh, general perspective on the, this decision especially in, in uh, this uh, era where uh, there is the, 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 the quest for a world, a new world order? Okay, uh, thank you, Clarice. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, this is something that uh, Joe Biden had called for uh, a couple of years ago, and um, Modi, uh, the Indian Prime Minister, picked on it. Uh, we want to also say kudos to him for actually pushing for inclusion into the G20. Um, but it has gone long back. Africa advocated for this for some time to go. And I begin by saying that let's understand the perspective here because the G, a lot of my friends, some of them asking, uh, Africa is not a country. Why is Africa being uh, admitted as a country instead of, you know, those are member states and we're talking about a continent. Let us understand that the G20 also has the European Union as a member, as a non governmental member. So it is not just independent member states that are members of the G20 also have intergovernmental bodies that are members of the G20, the U European Union being one. Africa is just, you know, following the leads of the European Union. But a lead up to that is to understand that Africa is not asking for handouts for all our brothers and sisters, Africans all over the world, black people all over the world. Let us understand that Africa is not asking for handouts here. They are not going into the G20 to ask for handouts because we are dealing with 1.3 billion people in the world, Africans. 1.3 billion people. And according to United Nations Development Index, they're forecasting that by 2050, that population is going to double, which means by 2050, Africa is going to be 2.6 billion. So we are talking about a huge gigantic market that the G20 members are already, let me say this again, already dealing with. It's not like Africa is excluded, but Africa is not on the table of discussions and decision-making and negotiation. They are already dealing with African, they're already dealing with African countries, apart from South Africa that is a, that is a member of the G20. Non-other African state is a member of the G20. But that has not excluded the G20 from dealing with them. In fact, if you look at figures, if the last one I saw, close to about between 60 to 75% of the GDP of the world is controlled by these G20 members. So there is no way that 50 to 75% of GDP of the world is being managed and controlled with the exclusion of Africa. So Africa is already playing a part in the G20. The only problem is that Africa has not been on the table of decision making. They have not been at the forefront of political decision, financial decision, and so on and so forth. So now that Africa has come in, has been accepted, what is the way forward? Because this is where 
we always say the the devil is in the detail. The devil is in the detail. What does it mean for Africa? It is true that G20 offers a huge, huge platform for Africa. But what is going to matter is the committee that actually run the G20, because it's not the photo op that we see on TV that matters. We have more than 200 something committees that are running the G20, financial community, international trade, finance, interest rates, uh, communication, different committees. So it is up to the African Union to make sure that there is absolute participation and not just a photo op of the membership of the African Union in that G20, which means the African Union, for example, we are talking about the Agenda 2063 or Agenda 2060. That should be at the forefront of whoever is representing Africa at the G20 uh, committee uh, summit, because these summits always happen maybe way before this photo op meeting where they all sit together and they're making speeches or oh, not. The real details lies in those committees. We have the African Free Trade Agreement that we are discussing. It's currently going on in the world right now. How does Africa fit in? How do they make sure that their interests are taken care of? We have, we are talking about the African monetary policy, because right now Africa is so disjointed when it comes to monetary policy. You live from one country to the other, you're having a different system, a different money, monetary policy, a different arrangement, a different custom system, a different finance system, and so on. So Africa is so disjointed. So when it comes to those committees and those ideas that are going to be implemented, this is where we need sons of Africa that know what it means to negotiate at the international body. I am not going to shy away calling names here because if we find people like former ambassador of African Union to the, to the United States, like Ambassador Dr. Arikana, people that have been at the forefront of Africa uh, emancipation, people like Julius Melema, who is putting pressure on the African parliament, if you look at what he's doing in the African parliament, People like Professor Julius, uh, uh, Professor Lumumba, we need people that can negotiate clarity. We need people that can stand on the table that go toe to toe, because this is where Africa has always been cheated. If you take the, uh, Pakis, Pakisab, uh, the African current chairperson now, Secretary General, and so on, and you send him there, he's going to go for follow up. Because we've seen the result in time past that nothing has really come out from international organizations where Africa is a member state because we do not have people that understand how to sit on the negotiating table and ha make Africa have a voice. So going forward, you know, as we're going to be discussing, the devil is in the details. What is Africa going to do in those committees? Who is going to represent Africa? What ideas is he or she going to be pushing forward? You know, in the French zone, for example, where there's clamoring for liberation from French uh, hegemony. Who is going to speak on the idea, on the issue of the current French France that is currently hijacked, hijacking more than 15 to 20 states of Africa? The economy is decimated because it's tapped. They are not economically independent. Who is going to represent Africa? When it comes to trade, we are coming talking about the African free trade zone, for example. Those are ideas that we need the African feminine representative to the G20 to bring to the table so that we know that we are not just going there for photo art. We're not just going there to, you know, give a platform for them for trade because this is a huge trade opportunity for the G20. We represent, we are, right now we are more consumers because we are like a, a place where everybody comes and dumps and dumps and dumps and we consume. But what are we exporting? What are we presenting on the table? Talk about the financial aspect. I can go on and on because one of the critical, critical things that I want to mention before I give you the microphone, Clarice, is the oh, fact okay. that yeah. if you look at the dead burden of Africa, if you look at the dead burden of Africa, that is one of the killing, killing aspects that is killing the African economy. The IMF, the World Bank, mm -hmm. these people have representative within the G20. The African representative should be able to press for a read constructions of the preamble and the 
architecture of the Af I mean, uh, IMF and the World Bank so that yeah. Africa is not getting killed by the kind of loans that they take, loans with strings and loans that actually compromise the, I mean, uh, the sovereignty of African states. So these things in a nutshell need to be looked into. And whoever, whoever is going to represent Africa in that G20 must make sure that he goes there not to for further up, he goes there with a real agenda of what Africa is going to gain. I Absolutely. will give the microphone to others to talk. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Elijah Inoku, it's about uh, being intentional and how can Africa uh, benefit from this uh, enclosure or integration uh, into one of the world's uh, largest uh, uh, economic blocks? Uh, we are going to continue with you, dear Punima, in your uh, uh, introductory statement, you made mentioned about the changes occurring at the, the global level. You made mention uh, the, 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 the call uh, by BRICS nation for more reforms to be uh, implemented, especially in the United Nations and even with the financial, uh, leading financial institution across uh, the globe. And uh, of course, uh, being very keen about uh, uh, the uh, meeting of, of the G20 that led to the admission of the African Union, in your perspective, uh, what do you think uh, this uh, increased representation of the African continent will mean uh, in global decision making uh, will signify for the African continent and its people? Yes, uh, Clarice, it is very important that uh, when you are having more space in the world uh, stage, your power will increase, definitely. So now Africa, as our previous speaker was speaking, that uh, Africa is having everything, but the only problem is that who will represent and at which stage they will represent the voice of Africa. So this is important and I think in the expansion of BRICS countries as well as expansion in G20, Africa will have very bright future. And of course, African people are having everything. Uh, they know all the languages of the world and they are expanded uh, in whole world. They are present in US, they are present in UK, Europe, Asia, Africa, everywhere they are present. So this synergy will make them very strong and they are having uh, all knowledge and they are having good uh, uh, IT sector also. Uh, though they need more educative uh, tools in Africa because so many uh, countries did not uh, well educated till now. So you are having very big broad uh, space for the higher education or digital education and digital finance uh, because rural areas not still touch with the modern development so i think this new uh, development and new relationship with g20 and BRICS will give more uh, impetus with, with more landscape to african continent to expand their rights and to raise their voice uh, in the whole world to make them more better citizen and to take participation in the new economic solutions New economic uh, solutions. Uh, let me uh, continue with you, uh, uh, Jane. We are looking at uh, the African Union incorporated in uh, the uh, Group of 20, and uh, on the economic perspective, in your uh, in your own opinion, uh, what do you think are the potential benefits of the African Union joining the G20 in terms of uh, economic growth, investment, and uh, development opportunities? for the African nations, you are so optimistic eh, about the, the continent or the, the continent's inter institutional bloc, AU joining uh, the, uh, the, the group of 20. Thanks, Gladys, for this question. I think uh, this is something we must ponder upon, specifically because G20 is all about the financial track. And when we talk about the agenda of G20, it is about the economic progress of each and every nation, each and every citizen. I think Elijah has rightly pointed out that the devil lies in the details. Yes, I agree to that. But I strongly feel that inclusion is the very first step. As part of the G20, Africa gets the much uh, needed space that it required in the global space. 
So that is the first step. Now the onus definitely lies a lot on the leadership of the African Union. Number one, for a continent, for a sub-region as ACA, all of us would understand there would be some internal strife. But when you are representing as a group of 55 nations, you have to come together as one voice of one people. We can deal with our domestic problems in separate uh, forums, but when we speak at G20, it has to be the voice of Africans, voice of African youth, voice of African women, voice of African workforce. And again, Elijah had pointed out that Africa is a very strong country when it comes to population. You comprise of 1.3 billion people. That's not a small amount. That is a huge population. And that is your innate strength. That is the innate strength of the African subcontinent. We have to mobilize on that strength. Long uh, are the days gone when we thought that the population could be a problem. But I think if we use the technology properly, if we use our human resource properly, that can become our biggest strength. Being part of G20, I think there are two very important things that must be kept in mind when we are talking about our agendas. Number one should be the infrastructure development. While there are few nations within the African subcontinent uh, which have a strong infrastructure, but we often keep hearing stories in our media so-and-so country does not have a very good infrastructure. So we must focus on building the required infrastructure, number one. And number two is definitely the transfer of technology. From a long time, what is happening is the developed nations are using the resources of the global south, only the natural resources of the global south, and they are getting rich day by day, year by year. Now, what needs to be done is transfer the technology to the base nations, to the base continents. And that is the only way forward. So we have to, not only the African Union, but the Global South as a group must talk about technology transfer. They must focus on the sustainable development goals that have been being talked about since forever. We have to come together as a common voice and put pressure on the developed nations to incorporate the changes that the global south is looking for. Um, but I'm really hopeful because uh, we have seen how we could do that this time in India. We could come up with a joint declaration in spite of so many hiccups, we could come out. That is our power. That is the power of soft diplomacy. So I'm really hopeful that with the inclusion of African Union, the African people and their voices will get boost. of every African uh, like uh, Mr. Ledger and uh, Madam Punima highlighted of course uh, uh, what will Africa bring to the table and of course who are those to represent the African Union or the African continent as far as decision making is concerned as uh, at the uh, uh, group of 20 in the same light uh, with Mr. Otomobli uh, we are talking about Africa's inclusion in uh, the uh, group of 20 and of course uh, uh, taking also a critical look at the global transformation that is taking place but when when this transformation comes and of course we see incorporation or integration we begin to think about uh, these uh, principle of non-interference sir in your own uh, opinion uh, where does the, the principle of non-interference come in as far as uh, African states are concerned how can they fully engage with the group of 20 and other uh, international bodies where the continent belong uh, by so uh, doing and also uh, preserve the sovereignty which is prime in uh, the present uh, global context this is a very important conversation to have uh, from the standpoint of the diaspora and those of us who are african who are in the diaspora we are certainly overdue in africa for uh, much more progress than is being presented by an inclusion simply in the G20. Uh, there are other bodies, the United Nations and uh, other international bodies 
uh, that uh, Africa has had historically leadership roles and responsibilities in that have diminished. We have to look at why we are at this particular juncture. What precipitated the rest of the international community, Joe Biden and whoever made sense to include Africa at this time in the G20? What, what, what caused that? And certainly we have to understand and have to recognize that the rise of those sub-Saharan states uh, at this juncture following years ago, the Southern African states that moved the needle dramatically towards liberating those countries and those populations that so necessarily needed to be freed from just abject exploitation, poverty, resource, theft, and all of the things that, that, that plagued Africa for a long time. Africa is overdue. We're overdue for an accelerated uh, thrust into catching up with the rest of the world. I don't think most Africans, and I think the sub-Saharan uh, African uh, movements that are in progress right now, the, the uh, temperature of the people in the streets right now is going to be patient and allow the machinations of the devil being in the details and committee meetings uh, and the uh, uh, 2064 proposals. Africa is not going to wait is not going to wait for those protracted uh, progress to, uh, to, to materialize, frankly. And I think that most people on the ground in Africa would agree uh, with that. Certainly the most important thing that has been pronounced over the last five, 10 years has been the work of Dr. Ericana and what she shared with us here in the United States when she was the ambassador and had that post at the UN or, or at the AU rather. Uh, and she was uh, certainly relieved of that post, but it was her, if you recall, who pointed out what was going on in Francophone Africa in such a graphic way that it really shocked the sensibilities of particularly the diaspora in the United States and in the rest of the world to respond. And that response reverberated straight back to those Francophone states. But the Francophone states aren't the only culprits in the tragedy that we see uh, in, in Africa at the hands of the European nations and at the hands of the West. Uh, the British and certainly the other colonial powers that have been at play on the continent for the last 100 years are still very culpable in their designs to exploit and essentially dehumanize uh, Africa. So I would encourage the nations of the world, those who consider themselves really friends of Africa, true friends of Africa, true allies of Africa, to accelerate or agitate for the acceleration of Africa's participation in the international community. I don't know if we, uh, at this forum, remember the non-aligned states. I'm old enough to remember the non-aligned states. And uh, it was East and West, and there were the non-aligned states in the middle. And the non-aligned states played an extremely important role. We don't have a non-aligned state structure anymore. However, I'm very excited about the development of BRICS and the potential for BRICS to be a new voice and a new representative of what Africa critically needs. So I would again encourage an acceleration, a serious discussion about uh, bringing Africa and its 
1.4 billion people uh, into the real uh, the real body of the rest of the world. If you've got 1.4 billion people, you don't need to be in a G20 where you are 120th of the world's rep representation or, or, or population representation in terms of your influence. Uh, that is a, there's only seven, almost 8 billion people on the planet. And for 1.4 of them to be in Africa, obviously there is much, much more room for a much more uh, substantive uh, uh, position in uh, being able to articulate uh, the, the needs and the conditions of Africa. And finally, I will say the resource, disproportionate resource control that Africa exercises makes it a, almost a no brainer. I mean, I can't believe that it took this long for any of the G20, 40, 50s, whatever they call themselves, to simply turn and recognize that Africa needed a voice at the table. But I do think it's a day late and a dollar short. I don't think the African people on the ground really care about being represented at, at the G20. I think that Africa will carve out its own shaping going forward of how Africa will be structured and and thus treated in the world and in, in its economies. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that we're extremely supportive of uh, Africa and its movements now towards true independence. Thank you. Uh, let me stay with you, Mr. Mobley, uh, talking about uh, true independence and uh, looking at uh, the uh, development across the global world and like you underlined and every other uh, panelist already underlined, uh, Africa is a reshaping in every uh, dimension, politically, economically, and what have you. And you, you make mention about something which I want us, uh, you particularly to dwell on, uh, talking about the enclosure of Africa into the group of 20. And of course, uh, when we look at how uh, the world uh, evolves and, and the diplomacy of every nation, uh, there is, uh, we come to a conclusion of that there is always what we call interest. So now, and we are also in the era of new colonialism. So with uh, these uh, uh, global changes, and of course the multipolar world coming into play, how can uh, uh, the uh, uh, development or uh, interaction or international relations between uh, continents across uh, the global world uh, function in such a way uh, that uh, there will, it will not be uh, uh, some sort of a master servant where we see stronger economies actually suppressing uh, the weaker one. How can uh, we uh, function at uh, uh, equal levels th that will actually fast track uh, this uh, development, feasible development, especially in the African continent because sometimes it is so problematic to think that Africa has uh, the natural resources, even the human capital, but then when you want to rate the level of development of the continent Africa, it becomes so problematic. So how can, together with uh, this new uh, uh, shape of things and of uh, uh, new perspectives in the uh, international uh, cooperation, how can Africa maximize this, especially with enclosure, uh, uh, being part of uh, industrialized nations? Absolutely. Africa is at a critical and very dangerous nexus at this point. You mentioned uh, this scramble to recolonize uh, Africa as uh, we have interpreted it. Uh, Africa is in danger of having uh, or being torn, being war torn uh, all across the continent uh, over the next several years. If Africans do not assert that they are not going to allow a protracted admission into the rest of the world and its economies and uh, recognition and, uh, and, and, and an end to the movement to recolonize Africa. We have to call for a immediate cessation of those hostilities in Africa. We have, we have um, 
this advent recently since uh, the destruction of the economy and the government of Libya. Uh, we've had we've been overrun uh, throughout the northern uh, uh, desert regions of the Sahara and then also of the Sahel uh, with uh, so-called uh, Islamic terrorism. And so it's been used as a pretext to bring in uh, U.S. military troops. And U.S. has over 30 different military installations around Africa. France never left Africa, of course, and Britain has never left Africa as well. They are all there in part, and they have mercenaries, and, and actually they're national troops uh, on the ground. Uh, there is a mock concept that China and Russia have also designs on African resources and African lands, and they have uh, an interest at, at stake. And the, the discussion tries to tries to uh, just equalize the threat uh, among these among these uh, all, all of these nations. Of course, that is folly, and does not and is not supported by military installations from China and Russia on the ground or India uh, or other nations. We know who the colonizers have been in Africa for the last 100 years. We know people who have entrenched their interest in the theft of African resources. We just heard the other day that France was paying uh, Niger a very small sum for a kilo of uranium uh, taken from uh, Niger, uh, uh, Niger. Uh, the international market price for a kilo of, of uh, uranium is 200 euros. France, a month ago, was paying 80 cents per kilo for uranium from Niger. So this, I think, is indicative of the level of just vulgar exploitation of the African continent that is going to continue if we accept that we can sign up for the G20 and that is a sense of progress. If the G20 and those nations again represented, they call themselves friends of Africa, if they are in the, in the BRICS countries as well that call themselves friends of, of the entire African continent, yeah. if they don't step up immediately and make sure that Africa is included on the world stage in a proportional way in, from population to its level of resource contribution to the world and others and give Africa the, the, the place at the table that it needs. That's what's wrong with the international community today. It discounts and dismisses Africa wholesale. It just, it, 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 it completely it, it, it ignores Africa. The climate crisis is because they ignore Africa. You can't ignore the largest land mass on the planet next to the, the uh, Asian continent and claim that you are uh, trying to be inclusive when it comes to solving the problem of global warming and uh, climate change uh, on the planet. And to do that, you have to pull African people into this mix. You have to pull African people to the table. We don't need just one or two representatives. I'm sure in any country or any area across the African continent, you can find representative voices that could contribute very well to this international discussion. And you can go throughout the diaspora and find people as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's overdue and we need to move in that direction. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mobley, uh, for that uh, 
coming back to you, uh, Mr. Elijah Enoku, uh, after listening to all of the uh, preliminary uh, statements from uh, this uh, panel of experts, now uh, this question uh, will be directed to you. Uh, uh, in your opinion or in your perspective, what uh, should uh, or what measures should the African governments take to strengthen uh, their uh, diplomatic and uh, negotiation uh, capacities uh, to effectively participate in uh, this uh, global decision making? Yeah, Clarice, I started by saying that the devil is in the details. And let's talk a little bit of details here because that's actually where the issue is going to lie. That is where I'm going to see the sincerity of the G20, including members of the BRICS. Because my colleague, uh, Mr. Arthur, talked about the BRICS. I'm very happy with what the BRICS is trying to do, yeah. but I need concrete action on the table. Jane talked about transfer of technology. I agree with her 100%. But here is the problem, which I want to see before I agree that the G20 are actually serious and taking Africa seriously. When it comes to the transfer of technology, when the Africa ICT committee sits and asks for member states of the G20 to deal with Africa in terms of transferring the technology that they are currently using in Africa, transferring their intellectual, part of the intellectual property right. Will they agree? That's what I want to see. China, for example, is a member of the BRICS. And China is the greatest trading partner of, with Africa now in terms of member states. It's China, way beyond any other country. They, there's no competitor right now. But when it comes to transfer of technology, Jane and the rest of the panelists. China is having a trade deficit of 47 billion with Africa. A trade deficit. We are talking about a country that is actually, ex I mean, gaining from the resources of Africa and leaving no traces behind. So this is where we talked about devil being in the details. Yeah, they will make photo up, but when it comes to actually doing something, we are going to see, I hope, let me not be negative here, I hope we are going to see progress. Number two, the current fever and enthusiasm in Africa is the fact that some African leaders, those that are very progressive in nature, they are clamoring for transformation of natural resources on the continent of Africa before being shipped abroad. Paul Kagame has come out and declared that the African Union should come up with a preamble that they're going to present to the G20, United Nations, and all the other bodies and say, no natural product should leave the continent of Africa without being transformed into at least a semi-finished product. Finished product yeah. Do you think, all of you listening to me, do you think the G20 are going to agree to this? Because that's a huge trade imbalance right there. That's a huge trade imbalance. Take example, just a simple thing like cocoa. You know, those cocoa beans, it doesn't take much to transform cocoa into chocolate. But we don't see that happen on the continent of Africa because G20 and the Western nations are not yet ready to relinquish that economic advantage that they gain from just buying the raw products and transforming them in the Western world and then selling it back at almost 1,000 percent times to the African states. Are they ready to come to the table when it comes to negotiation in this area? Number three, concessions. We are talking about the IMF. If you look at the loans, I mentioned this before. If you look at the loans that the African states are taking from the IMF, the World Bank, the British Woods Institutions, and all the other ones, it is killing Africa because they are taking those loans at about 10, 15, 20 percent. And then the Western world take the same loan at about 0.1%. Therefore, the African states spend all their time servicing debt, not paying the debt, servicing the debt. The African Union and the African Financial Committee, they are clamoring for what we call concessional loans. That is to say, the resources of Africa should act as a backup, or we can call it collateral security, for any loan that Africa is going to get. Are the G20 ready to go along with that? 
That is what I say, the devil is always in the details. These people, I do not see them at the stage because that is where it's going to pinch them. And that's what Africa is going to gain. Are they ready for that? Now, you talk about mineral resources. Um, my colleague, Arthur Mobley, talked about the mineral resources for Africa. Mm -hmm. That is an area where it's going to take up even 10 of these uh, debates to talk about what Africa is losing in terms of its mineral resources. Sure. If you think about the metals and the minerals that are needed in the world right now in terms of, and, you know, the whole world is talking about renewable energy and climate change and everything that it needs to put in place, whether you're talking about adaptation or mitigation or whatever it is, I am telling you that Africa has everything. 60% of those renewable resources are in Africa that are needed to implement this, this action. If you listen to the president of Kenya, William Roto, mm -hmm. on the climate uh, uh, conference that just ended in Nairobi, you will understand the stakes in Africa. He came up and said, look, we are not the polluters. We have everything to help the polluters in the world put, you know, bring down this climate, whatever it is that's happening in the world. Are they ready to give us the money to implement mitigation or adaptation policy into place that will help the global? Because if the world is warming by 1% in North America, it's also warming by 1% in Africa, it's warming by 1% all over the world. So it's a global problem. Are they willing to give them the money to implement these strategies so that they can help the rest of the world? You see, they're dragging their feet. So when I say the devil is in the details, look at the COVID-19 vaccine, for example. When that happened, the vaccine was developed in the Western world without a problem. I'm not going to the politics of it. I'm talking about the economics of it. Let's leave the politics of it altogether. I'm talking about the economics of it. When it was discovered, African countries said, we have a country like South Africa and Egypt and some of the advanced African countries. They said, we have the technology, technology to develop this vaccine, I mean, to manufacture this vaccine locally transfer the intellectual property right to us, let us manufacture it uh, locally. You saw what happened. The international community, they were not ready to relinquish the technology to that will allow African countries to produce that same vaccine that they are producing here. So when I say the devil is in the details, if this is what is hampering Africa and these people, I am not sure that they are willing to let go of some of the benefits that they are having from Africa until we see concrete action, then we will know they are coming to the table with good faith. I am not going to be negative here. Let's Matt. hope. Let's hope that that's going to be the the, uh, the way of going forward. But again, Absolutely. to answer your question, we are still far from seeing concrete action, Clarice. We are still far from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is uh, the uh, primary stage, and of course, uh, uh, the essence of a debate like this is to uh, bring out uh, insight on how the stakeholders. Clarice, the microphone yeah? is off. We can't hear you. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Elijah. In our core, of course, we're saying uh, uh, that, of course, is still at the preliminary stage. But uh, the, the 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 reason for a debate like this is to see how we can bring insightful uh, uh, debates or discussions and that will help the stakeholders representing the continent Africa at uh, the global level. And uh, we are going to continue with you, uh, dear Punima, uh, listening to Mr. Elijah Enorko. Uh, of course, he has shared some very pertinent points. Uh, so now, you know, India is a friend of Africa. You've always uh, been very particular about that. Now, to be able to uh, to gain from the, this uh, global change or from this global transformation, uh, what do you think can African countries do in terms of maybe reshaping their foreign policies uh, that will help even to boost uh, the the production uh, uh, capacity of African countries and of course take African nations uh, uh, a step ahead in terms of uh, production or transformation of resources in uh, the African continent that will continue to help to uh, redefine and bring a positive outlook to the continent's economic trajectory. Clarice, uh, this is a very important question of the day of this conversation 
because in current time as we are feeling that uh, everybody is searching new space in new economic model so now new democratic institution is also very important to be uh, creating because earlier model was started from the euro and united nation now when we are raising our own economic model and we want to utilize our own resources for our public our people so this is important that new right uh, uh, democratic institution should be raised new think tanks should be raised in africa and asia and in brics countries so structuring is required that what uh, what is our new policies what is our new agenda and what is our new needs of our time so uh, first thing is that uh, we should plan our new uh, uh, the, the democratic uh, institutions second new think tanks and new uh, economic uh, institution then we can plan new strategies after covid or after ukraine crisis because we have to be very accountable for the people and i feel this is the high time when we will we should think that it should be a human centric development not any country centric or continent centric it should be a human centric because now it is high time in digital world that all people are equal and they are having equal rights to survive on this planet so this is my uh, first point because our prime minister narendra modi said this is a one planet one home and one future so it should be very equal and very uh, progressive and everybody should get uh, their right to have their uh, expression or their willingness that's why we recently visited to uh, four regions of uh, russia uh, which are taking place new democratic rights and we visited there and we understand why people wanted to change their country why people want their democratic right because they want to be a participatory they they want to be a human centric uh, development so this is very necessary that we should have uh, accept uh, our colonial system or british constitution or the structure of ngos and uh, uh, political parties we are following from last 75 years we need to restructure rethink and replan so i hope uh, uh, many uh, countries are uh, in multipolar world uh, doing it that's why brics is expanding and uh, many countries are interested for the digital solutions that how new currency can be developed for the trade so time is changing very fast and uh, i feel that africa will play very important role in upcoming economic new model of the world and uh, we will see that uh, uh, real technology transfer and uh, education transfer will be held in african continent because many african uh, villages and uh, countries are underdeveloped so we can really transfer all technological and resources through china or russia or europe uh, to african countries so earlier as our previous speaker was speaking that everybody taken the resources of africa now it is high time that all countries all continent should return to africa as uh, during brics summit ramaphosa president of south africa said that uh, in previous time everybody taken our resources now when we say that please make our hospitals schools roads infrastructure then they say please give us money so point is that when you were taking their resources you did not pay now when they need development you are saying give us the money who will give the money so it is a time of return it is a time of u turn of the uh, economic development and resources of africa and i am very positive that uh, in multipolar world african continent will rise and uh, we will see that uh, all the development in digital age will be very fast thank you very much
thank you for that, uh, dear Punima. Just a reminder, those of you tuning in, uh, that this is uh, the Pan-African debate on African media television. And today we are analyzing how Africa's representation in global decision making will bring a new perspective uh, to the continent Africa. And of course, what are the spheres and what are the uh, stakeholders in Africa supposed to do to be able to uh, maximize the opportunities that come with the recent integration or inter uh, incorporation of the African continent into a uh, worse uh, leading economic blocks and of course the numbers are on your screen you are free to dial uh, and of course uh, share your own opinion of what you think uh, about our topic for discussion today and uh, before your calls uh, come in we are going to continue uh, in the same light with uh, the analysis uh, with uh, these uh, uh, this panel of experts let's uh, continue with with you uh, Jang uh, of course we are talking about uh, Africa uh, being at the central stage we are looking at the G20 which is uh, the uh, latest uh, block that just admitted or recognize uh, uh, the uh, capacity of African uh, continent or the African Union that can hold a permanent membership in uh, these uh, uh, worst economic block. So the question is, in uh, wanting to fight poverty or to er uh, eradicate poverty, to boost uh, infrastructure, and of course to ensure access to health and uh, education. So now, how can uh, the... Uh, the, the group of 20 be uh, a, a catalyst uh, that will facilitate uh, uh, Africa realizing uh, these uh, very important uh, aspects. You know, the OSC, an ailing population cannot actually deliver. So how can the group of 20 assist the African continent in the sphere of poverty er er eradication, infrastructure development, health care, and education? Gladys, like I had already said, technology transfer would be one of the major criterion that has to be considered. And I can firsthand tell you that I was present in many of the G20 deliberations that happened, and uh, I very well understand the inhibitions that Elijah has due to the historical reasons, but I can firsthand tell you that uh, even this year during the deliberations of G20 during the meetings, these issues were actually discussed. And like Purnima Madam has mentioned that we are talking about human-centric development. So when we talk about human-centric development, we do not differentiate people on the basis of nationality. Absolutely. We have had discussions on issues like poverty eradication, about access to education and health, about access to infrastructure, to the African nations, to the most poverty stricken African nations. We want, we really want the African children to have access to quality education so that they can raise, rise up as, you know, empowered individuals and they can then contribute to the global development. Mm -hmm. So I, while I understand the inhibitions that we have, but I strongly feel we have to move past the suspicions because, you know, I agree when you say that the, there is a debt problem. We need restructuring of debt. I do not deny that. But the good thing is we have started talking about it. We need to realize that the financial institutions like uh, IMF or World Bank, they were formed post-World War II era. And they were formed keeping that those situations in mind. Now we are in post-COVID phase. So now the... Now we need new systems, we need new thoughts, we need new policies. And that is exactly the direction we are moving in. We have been talking about multilateral banks, we have been talking about debt restructuring, we have been talking about climate financing. The principle of polluter pays has been there for decades. So I for sure is hopeful because I have been a part of the deliberations and I know that this has been in the hearts and minds of the delegates from across the globe. Uh, one thing that I want to really point out is we have to stop differentiating in the post-COVID world order. We have to stop differentiating on the basis of nations. 
on the basis of any man made human made the distinctions i always say there's one thing that the virus taught us that there's no distinction the way covid impacted people in africa the same way it impacted people in asia we humans need to realize that we are we are talking about shared future and that can only come when all of us come together as one human being and that was exactly the theme of india's g20 presidency vasudev kutumbakam that is we are one family one earth and we have a one future we have a shared future so my request to everyone hearing us today would be to stand together as one human beings let us stop differentiating we have to build that trust we have to work to on building the trust deficit there's a lot of deficit in trust and that is why we are always thinking in those terms but the need of the hour is to break that trust deficit and i feel that the youth has a major role to play in that so i for sure is very hopeful and uh, for me the first process is discussions i'm sure it will take time for it to get implemented but at least the right questions are being raised we are thinking in the right direction the right questions are being raised at the right platforms and in future we will have those uh, memorandum signed we will have those technologies transferred if i talk about india maybe 3 decades back even we were facing these problems of technology transfer so it is a process it is not a one day thing it is a process and we are moving in the right direction so let us be hopeful that is my request to each one of you uh, uh listening to you kinley uh, i will stay with you jang uh talking about uh, building trust and of course uh, uh ensuring uh, uh that everyone is included as far as uh, uh, the global changes are concerned do you think with uh, the uh, recent uh, geopolitical maneuver or geopolitical shift in a uh, worse uh, in uh, in the global world I is it going to be very practical or is it a philosophy that philosophy how pragmatic is that philosophy of inclusivity and of course ensuring one planet one earth and of course all for humanity Clarice definitely i would not say that uh, it is a very easy path definitely not these are uh, you know years of distrust years of uh, mistrust and there are real problems we have been witnessing uh, geopolitical uh, issues all across the globe and that is why there's more need to build that trust and dialogue you know war can never be a solution the only solution could be dialogue maybe when we start thinking like one human being we will understand that there's no difference between me and mr arthur the rights and duties of mr arthur towards this earth are similar to mine or the rights or duties of mr elijah are similar to us is sitting here in india and similarly a person in us has to understand that once we understand that once we understand the human centric nature of things and covid again i would point out has shown this to the world mm -hmm. the problem is we have a very small memory that virus did not differentiate on the basis of nation nationality religion race color or anything the whole world came to a standstill yeah. i think that should come as an eye opener to all of us that when something of that order when a problem of that order comes then the whole race human race is at risk and we could only surpass it as one common people i would talk about the maitri that uh, the, our honorable prime minister started we were following the vaccine diplomacy because we care for every human being in every part of the world and that once that is ingrained in our mind and heart i think that will be a solution and therefore i say that the youth has a major role to play because we are kind of dissociated i would not say completely dissociated with the past but kind of we can get over the past slightly easier and we have to come with out of the box solutions 
I would come to the New Delhi Declaration. Till the last moment, there was a doubt that the New Delhi Declaration would be passed. Yeah. Interesting thing with G20 is, even if one nation does a veto against the declaration, it is not passed. Mm -hmm. But those 20 nations came together and passed a declaration. That is, an, that is a testimony to the fact that when it comes to global issues, we all can have internal issues. I'm not talking about that, but when we have a global issue at hand, we can come together. And New Delhi Declaration is a testament to that. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jane, uh, for uh, the uh, insight. Uh, uh, and now, uh, if you're just joining us, you are most welcome. And it is the Pan African uh, debate. Uh, we continue to bring this uh, uh, discursive uh, debate to you to bring your to get your opinion on what is happening across uh, the global world and as a people of the African continent, how our global transformation or how is this global transformation uh, directly and indirectly affecting uh, uh, the African uh, continent? Uh, uh, coming to you, Mr. Arthur Mobley. We have analyzed and, of course, looking at uh, the uh, advantages uh, that uh, present uh, with, uh, with Africa if they join uh, these strong economic uh, uh, blog that have actually uh, uh, recorded a remarkable transformation. So now the question is, uh, when we come back to the African continent, we still have this issue of uh, the fact that the African continent it's actually divided in many uh, uh, dimensions, like we're talking about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that we don't have a, a, a single, even though with the African continent uh, free trade area, you still see that there is uh, this, uh, this integration across the African continent, the differences in the currency, uh, uh, of course, the fact that it is difficult uh, on political lines for countries to actually uh, maybe surrender their autonomy and every other obstacle that presents the African continent. Now, at uh, the global stage, what do you think are the right, uh, uh, maybe is the right uh, uh, modus operandi that uh, the stakeholders, especially political stakeholders in Africa can actually develop to be able to maximize the opportunities of uh, the uh, uh, presented by these uh, economic blocks or, or global economic blocks, uh, according to some pundit, the fact that Africans always go to the table or negotiating table as uh, different en uh, entities or states rather than just one global uh, 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 body, it's already a setback and it actually uh, reduces the uh, advantages that, that Africa can get from uh, this uh, uh, world of, uh, uh, of global integration. So in your opinion, what, what do you think is pragmatic in this uh, era? Well, again, thank you, uh, Clarice, for the forum. And the question, um, Africa is still in a place of stagnation because as, uh, as our other panelists have, have pointed out, we have fractionalization on the continent. Until Africa can project a stronger sense of unity, and I think the African Union, which developed out of the Organization for African uh, Unity, the OAU, uh, that was the strategy. That was, that was the plan back then. But that plan was constantly interrupted. It was constantly destabilized. It was constantly attacked by those colonial forces that wanted to keep Africa in a state of uh, chaos because it is ununified, it is disunified, it is fractionalized. So the fractionalization of Africa what we're experiencing in Africa today serves a particular group of people internationally. We can't sugarcoat this. We can't pretend like it doesn't happen. We can't pretend like Africans are too naive to understand what, has, what, is, what is occurring. I think 
we as African people internationally, we have been long standing proponents of human equity. We have been uh, the uh, vocal force in the world for human rights. The human rights declarations go all the way back to the 1930s and 40s. So, you know, it, it, this is not new that we as even young people uh, can take up a philosophy and an idea that yes, we expect that all the world's people are one. We are all one human family. We understand that we get that because the human family and the human race originated originally from Africa and anyone with any scientific understanding would, would, would note that. That is not the problem. The problem is those people who continue to benefit from a fractionalization of the, some people call them the uh, nations of the South. Uh, some people can just say those uh, 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 unfortunate countries in places like Africa that uh, are, are, are not able to organize to a to, to a degree where they can they can catch on and they can they can mobilize as a result of that organization. India knows full well what it takes to change a colonial system. China knows full well what it takes and what it took to change a colonial system. You have to throw off colonialism. You have to reject colonialism and. Africa's turn has finally come about. We've been struggling and working on it for the last 70 years or so. And bit by bit, state by state, we've been able to create at least an undercurrent movement of uh, resistance, resistance and objection to colonialism. So we're not going to allow colonialism to creep back in in any way. It's not going to come through the IMF, which IMF and World Bank were designed to promote colonialism. They were designed to perpetuate colonial systems and to create economic enslavement of people who were formally, militarily, and just culturally and socially enslaved. So we, again, we, we, some of us are a little older and you know we remember these things on our own flesh and our own spirit and our own proximity i remember in the u.s places that i couldn't go uh be admitted to and i remember things that i couldn't do as a child so if i can remember that then surely uh certainly institutionally we can we can flash back a few years so I, I say to young people in particular, notice what gets change. Notice what creates change in your culture. What created change recently in Africa was what happened in the Sahel, what happened in, what happened in China for that matter. We have to observe and be students of history, not just trying to uh, be uh, in the moment and in the present. We have to understand that history does have an impact on where we are today. Absolutely. So if we're students in understanding what just happened just a few decades ago, we will, we will know where we've been and uh, what, we, what we must do. But I agitate and I ask uh, Africans to continue to be vigilant and to continue to push for the kinds of change that you want. You see that if you push the military in your countries, you can force them to change out dated uh, backwards governments and open the way for real independence and true democracy as they have in India and as they have in China and as they have in other parts of the world, Europe and uh, are, are, are garnering even in, in Latin America these days. Africa is only behind because of the oppression that continues to be exerted against Africa. The destabilization, the underdevelopment of Africa is exactly what is keeping Africa 
in the state that it's in. But there is resistance on the ground in Africa. We know that. We can't ignore it. The G20 isn't ignoring it. That's why they come to tape table with this Johnny come lately idea of, of uh, admitting Africa into the G20. And there'll be others. There'll be other bids to placate and to patronize Africa. But those are the things that need to be outright resisted because the time is too urgent. Global warming is real. We do not have another 20, 30, 40 years to uh, progressively go through these incremental steps. Africa has the intelligence, it has the educated community today to do whatever you want to do in Africa, you can do it today. The populations exist. You don't have to wait for children to be educated or uh, another generation or two to be educated before you move forward in Africa to implement the same things that you have in Europe or America or Russia or anywhere else in the world. Africa is equivalent now. So we need to dismiss the nonsense and dismiss these myths about Africa and realize that Africa is ready right now today to participate on the international stage at any table, whether it's the Security Council. How does Security Council have five seats and no Africans on the Security Council? Sure. How does that happen? How, does, how, how are these international bodies being controlled by everyone else without any even inclusion or participation from Africa. Africa should be in a leadership role. So I applaud Cyril Ramaphosa and where South Africa is in the BRICS. As far as I'm concerned, Cyril Ramaphosa speaks for all of Africa. We have to acquiesce and understand that we can't have 57 uh, representatives of 57 countries sitting in these particular places. Sometimes we have to realize that, that Africans can speak for us, whether they're in South Africa, or they're in Cameroon, or they're in Mali, or the, whether they're in Ethiopia. I, 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 I acquiesce all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm African first, and whatever uh, distinction would be put on me in a secondary sense. So I, I, I think that's where we are, that's what time it is, and, and uh, the world and our friends around the world need to support us in that fact, in that reality. Africa needs to be accelerated forward, not incrementally moved in baby steps because someone thinks that that's more manageable from, from, from their standpoint. But it's not going to continue to work. The African people are not going to be patient for that. Thank you so much, Sir Arthur Alto Mobley, for that uh, uh, insight. Uh, let me come back to you, uh, oh, Madam Pudima and end. Uh, we are talking about uh, Africa here, which is the central stage. And uh, if I uh, get getting the, the viewpoint of Mr. Mobley, he made mention about oppression of African state in spite of the fact that the continent has everything natural and of course the human capital. Uh, we still see uh, this oppression even uh, in uh, the uh, present context. And then you are aware of uh, the uh, geopolitical uh, maneuver across the African continent and of course the, the I call it uh, the mad rush for the 21st century mad rush for the African continent. So now India being a member of the G20 and India has been very uh, uh, intentional about seeing uh, Africa's a representation. So in your opinion, how uh, uh, can uh, Africa's dealing with the G20 help the country to bring about stabilization across the continent Africa? Because uh, some pundits are of the view that with the wind of change that is blowing Africa in Africa at the political level, there are also some people who are very pessimists like uh, this uh, wind of change, of course, is bringing some changes in the political sphere, but it's trying to uh, impede or inhibit uh, uh, economic uh, growth across the African continent because most energy, uh, most uh, governments are channeling the energies in trying to ensure political uh, stability in uh, respective nations uh, that they have actually uh, kept at uh, bay uh, some uh, continental economic uh, uh, agendas or projects. So in your perspective, where does the G20 
G20 or the group of 20 stand in helping Africa uh, come about uh, a stability, especially political stability, uh, that will uh, open uh, the continent for greater uh, direct foreign investment and other uh, projects that can prosper Africa. Uh, Clarice, this is a very, really, very big question you raised, and uh, now we are towards the end of discussion. Absolutely. But the uh, point is that what G20 will add on to African continent, right? In short, what you want to know, right? Sure. So, uh, my point is that, that in current turbulence time, all countries in this planet are in problem. All governments are searching new ways to get their stability in their countries. So that's why I told when we are talking about new economic solution, we need to understand a delivery of new democratic institution and parties also. Mm -hmm. Because it is not easy to say that G20 will resolve all the problem of African continent or BRICS will resolve problem of all countries. This is a new time when we need to make our space for new economic and democratic solution. Sure. Because now people are not inside the country only, not in the continent, not in the United Nations structure. We are moving towards new uh, structures in 21st century. Yes, 21st century will belongs to Africa. This is no doubt because Africa is having all reserved things because of their innocence in the past due to their uneducation, due to their poverty. They were not knowing what they can achieve. But now they are rising. They know, their leaders know after Nelson Mandela revolution in Africa, all countries got their freedom and democracy, democratic rights. Somehow there is some colonial system is still existing. This need to be cleared by the African leader, African Union, a new uh, kind of uh, election structure need to be developed in all countries to give the voting right to all men and women of Africa. So coming back to G20, what G20 is uh, going to uh, support in Africa is very big question. And we need to discuss it more uh, in some other uh, session because G20 countries are also passing from very big turbulence time Absolutely. and they are having their own problems. So uh, problematic people sit together and have dialogue and search solution. This is one way. But uh, how they can uh, uh, develop each other, this is another question. But now I thinking that uh, new think tanks, what they are doing in digital world, we need blue economy. We need green economy. We need other uh, structures which can give the human-centric development approach to all nations, not government, not G20, G7, or BRICS, or non-alliance movement, ASEAN. So many alliances we have in the past, and new alliances will develop and developing. But okay. this is not the complete solution for human-centric development. Human-centric development will be uh solution when we will have digital currencies common currencies and green and blue economic uh, uh development and food security and energy security to every human being Absolutely. then we can see in reality development is happening so uh to all think tankers and uh, to all governments and to all alliances i only uh request or we can through this session dialogue and we can initiate innovative ideas that how we can provide energy security food security and health and education to every human being on this planet then it will be a great success of g20 and membership to the african union or any other airlines so BRICS is also moving towards uh, this uh, targets to provide food security and energy security during big summits. Let's see who will uh, win the race and who will create new model and who will really uh, give the strength to every human being, either it is China government or Russian government or United Nations 
African Union or G20. This is all stage players. But Absolutely. after all, we need equal rights for all human beings on this planet to live happily with love, with the care, and uh, for the development of uh, uh, this Mother Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you to dear Punima for that. Uh, Mr. Elijah Enoku, uh, you know, uh, I always reiterate uh, that the essence is to uh, bring uh, uh, the constructive uh, analysis uh, that will help uh, reshape uh, the, uh, the continent. And of course, uh, we are going uh, drawing closer to the end of the program, but then we still have time to uh, bring forth. Uh, before coming to you, let me take this uh, caller uh, joining us now. Hello to you. Please, can you tell us your name and where you're calling from? Hello? I'm calling from Canada. Yes. You're most welcome, sir. My name is, yeah. Yes, I have a, a question, I mean, a comment. Uh, but uh, I'm re I'm watching the 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 program, sure. and uh, I really think all the people who have uh, had some uh, comment comments about uh, France intervening in uh, Niger. What I just wanted to uh, mention, I'm sure that everybody knows about that, but France is not to re-establish Bazoum. But France is there for its uh, interest, the uranium, the gas, and the uh, oil. So whatever France will do to get that interest protected, they will do it. No matter how many people they will kill. But what I have to say to remind the Nigerians is France has tried that all over the world, but France has never succeeded in any a war. Mexico, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and so on, they always lose. But I encourage the people from Niger to be together with uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and uh, all the people, or the people of Niger, to be together and stand strong. France intervening in Niger will not guarantee their success. That's what I have to say. Okay. And uh, God bless Nigerians. Thank you so much. Uh, for, Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for participating. Uh, uh, Mr. Elijah, I will come uh, uh, come back to you. Uh, we were looking at uh, the place of Africa in uh, uh, integrating fully in uh, these uh, global changes uh, that are happening. And of course, I would love to have your own opinion. It's, uh, it's true, the question already uh, uh, surfaced, uh, but was directed to some other person. But I would love to have your opinion on this. It is about the political will and uh, reshaping Africa's foreign policies uh, that will help uh, the continent to fully integrate and have a greater voice in uh, the uh, uh, global stage or at the international stage. So uh, what do you have to say regarding the political will, uh, foreign policy uh, uh, changes? Because they say the changes in the world necessitate changes in policies existing in various countries. So what do you have to, to say uh, as far as this is concerned? Uh, Clarice, let me take our audience and everybody a little bit a step back so that we kind of orientate the discussion and understand where we are coming from for discussing this. The recent inclusion of the African Union into the G20, how did it come about? As I mentioned from the beginning, the United States had been pushing for this for a while. And why did they do that at this time? Because it's not new that Africa has been looking for a permanent seat of the Security Council, and the United States did not push for that. It's Japan that has been pushing for years 
that Africa should be included into the five member state or make it six or seven, whatever they want to do, and Africa should be on the table. I did not see the United States or Canada, where I live, pushing for this, pushing Africa for this. So suddenly, we see them trying to push Africa to the forefront at the G20. It is a change in geopolitical landscape that is happening in Africa that has pushed the Western powers to see how they can use Africa as a way to counter the influence of Russia on the continent of Africa. Let us call a spade a spade. So what is happening is they have seen that all the geopolitical interests are seem to be dominating in Africa. And in order to win favor from Africa, they want to be the friend of Africa and they're pushing Africa onto the forefront now, which is not a problem to me per se, because, you know, um, you can be the kingmaker when you have, you know, a young lady that's coming up and there are many boyfriends coming around, you know, it's an opportunity for you to make the best choice. So it's for Africa now to make the best decision as to, okay, we have all these partners that are juggling for interest in Africa now because of a geopolitical shift in the whole world, who do we go with or what is our interest? Because the problem I have always mentioned in different forums and different presentations and universities and wherever I've been called upon to give a speech is sometimes the fragmentation that we have back home causes a problem for us. I will always speak with examples because you asked me a very concrete example, a question, I'm going to give you concrete answers. A lot of speakers that have spoken against the existence of this French monetary uh, policy in Western Africa, a group of 15 plus nations using a currency that's been controlled by France and their reserve controlled by France. It is not that the African continents sit quietly and they're not doing anything about it. We saw that the ECOWAS came out with a preamble and a discussion an agreement to adopt a single currency that was supposed to win them of the French CFA. But what happened? We have the old fox that still came in, which is France, and used their friend in Ivory Coast to destroy that preamble. So the point I'm being that Africa is not sitting on its butts and not doing anything. They are doing anything, but Western monopoly, they have always had their way to use one of the one of few bad apples to destroy. African unity. That's what the problem has been in Africa. Now, number two, if the G20 actually want to help Africa, or no, let me not use that word help, because again, I want to stress here that Africa is not asking for handouts. That is not a discussion. Africa is not coming here asking for money, asking for handouts, and asking for help. No, Africa is asking for them to be respected because they are a gigantic political force to reckon with, which they, these people have been disrespecting all over the years and not giving Africa the rightful place. That is what Africa is asking for here. So they are not asking for, you know, handouts here, handouts here, handouts here. No. Africa is not asking for that. For example, we, we talk about the BRICS because when we talk, you know, sometimes BRICS seems to get a very positive pass or get it passed in Africa and say BRICS is going to offer Africa what it needs. But let's be critical and be honest to ourselves. If you find BRICS nations like Argentina that are so advanced in agriculture, the African uh, Agricultural Committee has been asking for a transfer of the technological know-how of agriculture from Argentina to the African countries. We are not seeing that happening. And Argentina is a member of the BRICS. They've been asking for this for years. So let's not just, you know, say BRICS is going to come in and solve the problem of geopolitical manipulation of Africa. No, we want a clear path, whether it is BRICS, whether it's G20, whether it's G uh, NATO, or whatever we are uh, working with, Africa wants to be represented and their contribution in the international scene needs to be respected. Now, you talk about does Africa need to be restructured for them to fit in into this new world order? No, no. African Union already has bodies and structures and preamble that can deal with any organization that comes forth to deal with Africa. We do not need you know, a new African structure to deal with this. The African Union is capable, if, like I started from the beginning by saying, 
if we have committees that are going to deal with all these subcommittees that are in, within the G20, and they understand what they are going in for, these people will be able to bring home and present the ideals of Africa and make sure that we act as a block. The block is already there. We don't need a new African structure to deal with G20. We don't need a new African structure to deal with uh, BRICS. We don't need that. We already have those structures in place. The question is, are those structures independent, competent, able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this? Because when I use toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I use it in context and I use it purposefully because this is not a walk in the park. You are dealing with organizations that have been estranged for years, and most of them, because when I say most of them, we are talking about conglomerates. Because people do not understand when it comes to dealing with Africa. It is not Macron, Macron policy per se, that is affecting Africa. They are the conglomerates, the Western industrial complex, those organizations that are entrenched in Africa that want to make sure that Africa remains under their canopy. We are talking about the Ballore. We are talking about all these multinationals. We are talking about these com companies that are holding their nation hostage. That is what we want to deal with. So the question is, those substructures within the African Union, are they competent enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these substructures that exist within the G20 or not? So far as I'm concerned, if we have the right people in the right place, I think Africa will be able to achieve what it needs within that G20. Number three, I said before that the ball lies in the hands of Africans. Because somebody asked a question there, oh, yeah, Africa and poverty, this. No, that is not the issue. The issue is Africa can't win itself of these people. But the structures that currently exist are not adequate. The structures are not functional. My colleague mentioned about Niger, or somebody already mentioned about Niger there and so on and so forth. The problem is not Macron. The problem is the international, multinational conglomerates that are operating in Niger, for example, that are buying the uranium, uh, Niger uranium at nine, uh, eight cents per kilo and selling in the Western world at 200 euro per kilo. That is where the problem is. And African sub-regional, I mean, African communities are going to deal with strong people that are coming from these groups. These are the people that are controlling the institutions in the Western world. These are the people that are making the policies behind the curtain. These are the people that are making, you know, when you see campaign going on in the Western world, you will understand what is happening here because you see all the interests that are campaigning, you see political art, you see this. Those are the people that are controlling the economy. Those are the people that are going to hamstring and hamstrung any policy that is going to help Africa eat itself of these people. As long as we do not understand the tactics and go toe to toe with these people, even the inclusion of Africa within the G20 will not yield the needed fruit. So again, we need within the African Union strong institutions, strong bodies, strong committees, people who understand what it means to go toe to toe with these people to represent the interests of Africa. Not people like you know, like I mentioned before, ECOWAS would have been off the Frank CFA by now. But what happened? We have political interests in France that torpedo the whole thing through the bad guy, Ivory Coast. And today we are still being held hostage by France CFP. I can go on and on and on. So these are the interests we have to contend with in Africa. And we need people in the right places to contend with this international conglomerate, Western industrial complex that are holding the nation hostage. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah Inoku. Well, let me come back to you, Mr. Alter Mobley. Uh, we are looking at uh, the, uh, the changes, the global transformation, uh, how Africa can fully intercept. I remember some years ago, the uh, chair of the African Union Commission and the person of Musa Faki Mahamad reiterated that uh, African, especially the political classes, aware of uh, the multilateralism uh, that is uh, 
uh, increasing across the African continent. And of course, you will bear with me, like Mr. Elijah and Noako just highlighted, uh, that there is uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, changing dynamics in the geopolitical landscape across Africa. And uh, that's why you see uh, the, the West full interest uh, in Africa in order to counteract uh, uh, Africa's uh, new uh, partners uh, uh, in uh, the uh, present uh, context. So now the, the question which I want us to uh, round off with is uh, how uh, the uh, private sector in Africa and uh, the uh, civil society can actually uh, uh, ensure uh, that uh, there is uh, this uh, narrative shift in every dimension and ensure uh, that Africa, like uh, the uh, AUCG highlighted, uh, that uh, aware of the multilateralism, it is an opportunity for Africa to re-strategize and see how they can uh, gain a, a proper or a greater uh, scope in uh, international uh, negotiations or international affairs. So what c role can the civil society play as far as uh, these uh, uh, changes are concerned, admission of the African Union to the G20, uh, the BRICS uh, coming, uh, and of course uh, wanting to end uh, this uh, Western hegemony, especially in uh, the continent. So what are your perspectives on this? Yes, thank you again. Clarice, um, I think we can go back to uh, Frederick Douglass in the U.S., uh, uh, who was an abolitionist for slavery, and uh, he said that the power concedes nothing without demand. African people still have to understand that they have the power. The power is at the grassroots level. The, the power is in the hands of those people who are in the streets, whether it's Guinea or, or Burkina Faso or Niger or um, Mali, who are saying, we want a change. We are tired of living in the conditions that we're living in. It doesn't matter that uh, you've got an organized civil society in some sectors if they are not cooperatively working towards unified principles and unified goals. Africa needs to develop a, a, a strategy based on what their populations are saying. That way you'll have the support of the populations. The populations can then be supported and upheld by those civil organizations, the whatever governmental structures that you have and military uh, institutions that you have as a response to what the people want. So don't feel that you as a individual in Africa are helpless and you have to wait on politicians, opportunists, and other people to speak on your behalf because they're never going to do that. Speak up and do what people do when they want change, and that is to get out and make it themselves. And if that requires new organizations about what ECOWAS is doing or what the G20 is doing, or even what BRICS is doing, or even the AU for that matter. If they're not serving the purposes of what the people need, what gives people the mobility and forward progress that they need at the rate that they need it, then you form your own institutions and you do it yourself. That's what people around the world do. That's what happened in India. That's why India is independence. They kicked the British out because they mobilized to do that. In, in China, they mobilized to kick the French out and the Japanese out. They mobilized to do that. Russia, same thing. Europe, France had, enough, had, had its own revolutions. But we do not have to go that far back to realize that we've had very structural, powerful leadership movements. I remember very distinctly when Muammar Gaddafi and Nelson Mandela 
and Robert Mugabe got together. They formulated creating a, a, a continental currency for Africa. They were going to use the gold dinar. And that effort uh, is what was the catalyst for the attack on Libya and the beginning of a, a, a new surge of problems in Africa today. So we have to uh, realize that we have the power right there at home to, to create the change. And I will yield, and I know you uh, are time sensitive, Clarice. Obviously, yeah, we have uh, the power to create uh, the right uh, change uh, in the world. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your great insight on uh, our topic for discussion uh, thus day, uh, Africa's representation in global decision making and what this uh, represents for the continent uh, Africa. I want to thank uh, those of you who participated that uh, participated via Facebook by uh, uh, leaving uh, your messages and those who called live uh, want to thank you for always making out time to engage uh, in uh, this uh, discursive uh, uh, debate program. Uh, of course, uh, it is time uh, to change and also get uh, uh, going with uh, the global uh, transformation in every sphere. And uh, of course, uh, like the leaders uh, mentioned, uh, it is high time uh, that uh, Africa, uh, of course, the panelists, it is high time uh, that African uh, leaders become more intentional and of course, uh, make the necessary uh, changes uh, uh, that needs to be done in uh, order to see uh, that the continent benefits more from the uh, 21st century new uh, uh, mud rush to uh, the African continent and also make the continent's voice heard loudly at the global stage. We want to acknowledge the technical crew for ensuring uh, that the program was a success. And of course, I want to thank you all for always trusting the Pan African Television. And it is on this note uh, that I'll be drawing the curtains into today's edition of the program, the Pan African Debate. But that's not all. Keep having a lovely moment in the company of our transmissions and do have a wonderful weekend. Bye bye and see you some other time. <music>